Great. Well, welcome everybody from wherever you are. And we've got some international uh, people coming in from Bulgaria, I saw, which is lovely. Um, my name is Bridget Coker. I'm a picture editor. I uh, have worked on The Guardian and The Observer and uh, various international magazines. Um, and I'm delighted to be hosting this second photo forum live. And in particular, to be in conversation with uh, Paul Lowe, um, an award-winning photographer. Many of you will know Paul from his documentary work, covering many of the really major world-changing events in the late 1980s and 1990s. Some of you will also know of Paul as an educator and principally in his role as leader of the MA Photojournalism and Documentary course at LCC in London, where he is also the reader in photography, specializing in research on photography and conflict, about which he has written and researched extensively, looking at genocide and war crimes. And in particular, he was interested in the liberation of the concentration camps in 1945, and the conflict in the former Yugoslavia. Um, in my research today, I discovered a whole lot more. Um, I discovered that Paul is a graduate from Clare College in Cambridge, where he read history and philosophy. He's one of what has been become known as the Newport Mafia, where he studied under David Hearn. Uh, Paul is also a former photographer with Network. Now, I actually knew that one because I am of that generation. A network was an amazing UK agency. And um, I should, I will say this, on a par if not better than Magnum. So there we go, it's out there. Um, he is currently a emeritus member of Seven and a consultant to the Seven Foundation, an academy particularly on online education for professional photojournalists. He's a consultant to the World Press Foundation. He's on the board of the Post-Conflict Research Center. He's a founding judge of IAFOR, a Documentary Photography Award. He's also a founding member of the Sarajevo organization, Warm Foundation. He's a writer, a critic, and a mentor. And if you've ever been to Format, you also know that he's a DJ. Paul's book, Bosnians, documented the 10 years of the war and post-war situation in Bosnia and was published in April 2005 by Saki Books. His latest publication is Understanding Photojournalism, co-authored with his colleague Dr Jenny Good and published by Bloomsbury. And Paul has just submitted again to Bloomsbury the manuscript for Reporting the Siege of Sarajevo, which he has co-authored with Professor Kenneth Morrison, and this is due to be published by Bloomsbury in January 2021. This is one of the first detailed accounts of the role international journalists played in documenting the life of the city under siege and during the conflict. Today, Paul and I will be looking at and discussing the impact COVID-19 has had um, on photography, on photographers, particularly on education and going forward with that. But before we start, um, and because it's such a treat to look at amazing photography, I've asked Paul to take us through his early years where he was published in The Guardian, The Observer, Sunday Telegraph, Sunday Times Magazine, Time and Newsweek, The Economist, amongst a myriad of other international pu publications. So Paul, your first big international assignment was a, re a massive moment in history the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989, and the beginning of the collapse of the Eastern Bloc and the Cold War. Can you tell us something about your experience in Berlin, how you got there, what your uh, experience was of doing that story? Yes, sorry, just trying to work out how to screen share and unmute myself at the same time. Okay. So I'm going to leave my microphone on now. Welcome, welcome. Hi. Yeah. So, uh, as you said, I, I studied history at university and then went on to do uh, documentary photography with David Hearn. And in a funny way, I feel like my, my life has come full circle because in many ways now I'm a, I'm a professional historian. A lot of the work I'm doing is looking at past events and how photography has played a part in those. But obviously for this pretty much this decade of 89 to 2000 or so, I was a sort of frontline uh, excavator of history 
as it was happening. And to me, as a young, a young man, that was incredibly exciting to be there literally as these major global events are unfolding in front of you. Um, I didn't set out to be a, a war photographer or a conflict photographer. I set out to cover, you know, I wanted to work in the media as a news photographer, or as a current affairs. And obviously, but obviously that decade was dominated by, by conflict. But you have to remember back in 89 when the Berlin Wall fell, uh, everybody thought this was the start of this incredible, brave new world of sort of, you know, Francis Fukuyama's end of history and liberal democracy had won and communism had fallen and everyone was going to be happy and rich and, and cheerful and life was going to be wonderful. And um, obviously, you know, whenever I'm shooting a story, uh, even a news story, I I'm always asking myself with that kind of historian academic eye almost or question, what is it about this situation? What is it about this particular story or this particular issue? that is unique, that marks it out, that perhaps will be the thing that will make it memorable in the future. Mm -hmm. And so it's actually quite, quite strange for me now to be looking back at these pictures because they are, you know, 30 years old and, and it's quite terrifying <laughs> that I've gone through all of that. It's, but, and yet, you know, the amazing thing about photography is it takes you right back again to that moment. I can almost feel, you know, back in that morning, this was the morning after the night before, as it were, the war. Um, I'd gone out there on a, on a for the Sunday Telegraph newspaper, on a kind of literally on a wing and a prayer, on a one day assignment, which is what we often did in those days. Uh, got off the plane, literally went straight to the wall and, and started working. And so this image, you know, for me, you know, what you're also trying to do as a photographer is, is try to encapsulate the situation in one frame as well as in a story. And, you know, in this one, you had this dawn light, you had the Reichstag in the background, you had the East German Guards, and you have this moment of, happiness and love and spontaneity caught by this beautiful light. And something else I always try to do when I can is find that face in the crowd, find that person that I can kind of connect with, even mm -hmm. if only momentarily, and use them as a point for the viewer to connect with and to kind of find some sort of um, interaction with, so they can really sort of, you know, humanize the story really. Because I think what's fascinated me is, is this sort of tension between the grand narrative and the petit narrative of history. The, these events are often set in, in motion by, by, uh, by you know, uh, generals and, and politicians and leaders, mm. but they're experienced mm. and they're lived through by, by people on the ground. Mm. Um, so yeah, absolutely, that's, that's kind of quite an extraordinary experience to have had, to be able to cover history in real time, if you like. Yeah, the, um, the, the beginning of the, the fall of communism, if you like, the, the toppling of the Eastern Bloc was followed quite quickly by Romania, which you also went to. I think you heard quite quickly about Ceausescu's collapse of regime. Um, can you tell us a little bit about uh, yeah. how, you got, how you got there? Actually? Sure. I mean, I, actually, I, 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 as I said, I flew out to Berlin, uh, literally just, I mean, in those days it was literally, you would have your camera bag with a bag full of film and a couple of Leicas and a couple of Nikon FM2s and, and off you would go. And I actually went out to Berlin on November, the morning of November the 12th, I think, and didn't come back for a month. I, I went on from there to what was still the Czechoslovakia, became the Czech and Slovak Republics and to Hungary. Um, and then I came back to London briefly and then almost straight away, um, you know, the, the, we heard on the news about the fall of Ceausescu and again, working with the Sunday Telegraph. But just before I come on to that, that story, I just wanted to reflect on one image, uh, which is from the Berlin Wall, which was my first ever cover photograph in a magazine. In fact, it was The Economist, so in theory, it's a newspaper, but we all know it's really a magazine. But um, for me, it was a really important moment, you know, getting your first cover on a major publication like that. And it also taught me something very interesting about, about photography that, you know, um, it's not always the really obvious dramatic close up flashbang whiz image that captures the imagination and that can create a symbol or a symbolic or metaphoric image. And so this was a, you know, a couple of days after the wall had come down and obviously somebody had chipped a huge hole in the wall and then somebody else had come along and placed this bunch of flowers. So it was that realization that you could create images that were very important and very valuable that were not dramatic and full of action, that were actually quieter and more reflective and a little bit more mm. competent, mm. if you like. Mm. So yeah, so, so Romania um, was an extraordinary experience again. I mean, especially in the beginning of my career, I have to say, you are seduced by the action and it does feel like you're in a Hollywood mm. movie. You know, it does feel, as I got older and I got more experienced, I, I realized that these are real people and things are happening to them, obviously, and people are being 
you know, literally sacrificing their lives at, at times. It's very difficult. And it actually became harder and harder. And I'll come on to that later to, to work mm. in these kind of situations. Mm. But at that time, you know, flying into Ch to, to Romania was extraordinary. We, we, uh, it was very hard to get in. So the Sunday Telegraph and the Express and the Telegraph chartered a private jet. So six of us flew out in this sort of Puff Daddy style jet with gold taps, uh, with a waiter of service and everything, mm. landed in Bulgaria. Mm. And then mm -hmm. managed to cross the, the border into Romania on the train and didn't get stopped amazingly. And we literally got off the train straight into the middle of the main square and, and you know, into this incredible um, uh, experience where the civilians had taken up weapons against Ceausescu's Securitate, the secret police, and there were gun battles going on in the street. But mm -hmm. what was really extraordinary is, and I found this multiple times in stories like this, that you have this incredible action unfolding in front of you. And yet one street away, life is going on, not, not entirely as normally, but relatively normally. Mm -hmm. And so what I love about this picture is this guy here in his jumper, his woolly jumper and his jeans, who's obviously kind of just grabbed a weapon and a helmet, transformed into a, a militiaman. And in the background, there's a whole crowd of people almost like watching a football match. You know, they're kind of attending, cheering them on and making sure that they're, that they're supporting the, uh, the guys that are putting their lives on the line there. So, you know, as I said, you're, when you're shooting a story, you're looking for a series of pictures that tell that story. And, and mm -hmm. in kind of real time, you're trying to process what are the key events, what are the key moments, what are the key symbols of the story. So one of the issues, one of the big things that the, the revolution did is they took the Romanian flag that had the communist symbol in the middle of it and cut that out to create this kind of new flag. Um, they're, they're sort of reworking of it. So getting a picture of that was obviously really important. So this was a real, a real sort of gift in a way where you know, you've got the sunset, the flames and the smoke in the background and the crowd waving these flags against that dramatic background. And then again, just trying to humanize it, really trying to find that face in the crowd that sums up the, the experience of, of the revolutionaries. Yeah, yeah. Just, just, as a, just as a picture editor, I'd be, and I'd be interested to know, how much freedom did you have to um, actually work the scene and decide what the story was? you were out there i think for the sunday telegraph is that right yeah i mean um, well with this did the yeah, with, just let you perform? yeah with a story like this yes i mean you, you're going backwards and forwards you know you're trying to get information from them but those days as well don't forget that we didn't have mobile phones and, and, no, and communication no. and you know you were trying to get through uh, on a really dodgy line and, and you know obviously it sounds ridiculous now but we were working with these Hasselblad uh, wine we had to carry a dark room with us first of all to process I was black and white and, and color at the time so color slide and black and white film so we would mm -hmm. process the film in the dark room sorry in the hotel bathroom uh, you know dry it with a hairdryer put it in mm -hmm. this Hasselblad scanner that was about the size of a large suitcase weighed about 15 20 kilos and then attempt to connect that to a, a modem that was hooked up to the telephone and you'd be listening out for that kind of <laughs> And of noise as they connected mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. Hasselblad scanner sent a 300k picture in three separations that took about 45 minutes to transmit so imagine mm -hmm. that today when you know your mobile mm -hmm. phone is taking a 30 megabyte picture and, yeah. and transmitting yeah. that by bluetooth instantly so you know it's an extraordinary change in the technology of communication mm -hmm. that we've had in that, mm -hmm. in that period yeah yeah this is one of my favorite pictures from that story. We, we, we managed to get in with the revolutions after they captured uh, or taken over the presidential palace, which is this huge kind of white elephant building in, in the center of Bucharest. And I just love the contrast between this kind of history painting on the wall, medieval style kings, and then these revolutionaries in their incredible mixed bag of, of uniforms and, and clothing and homemade, weapon, uh, homemade bandanas and so on. Mm. And I always imagine the guy on the right there is, is that he's calling for a pizza. He's like, can I get a couple of uh, <laughs> pepperoni and a margarita for the boys, please? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, it's great. The, the thing I love about the, the pictures from Roma Romania in particular is, is the, the other side of it. So the guy in the TV center, you know, these, as you say, the sort of mm. people out sitting in a funny room that isn't obviously their front room, you know, yeah. Out of, context. Just, funny, out of context. Yeah, there's a funny story about this one with the TV centre. I mean, I was one of the few, because I realised the importance of television. It was, it was a war where, or a conflict rather, where the t control of television and control of the media was really important. So this was the TV centre, and I managed to get in there with a young uh, student that was at, helping me translate and so on. 
and mm. took this picture at the time. It's not an amazing photograph, but it was very symbolic because on the screen there you can see tele you know, free Romanian television. And this is a, a group of um, you know, Romanian uh, revolutionaries who actually, you know, some of them went on to be quite well-known politicians. And I'd never noticed this before. I mean, I'd looked at this picture hundreds of times over the years and I'd never really noticed it. But I, um, I gave a workshop to some students from the Balkan region recently, one of whom is Romanian. And he pointed out that the man in the bottom there who kind of disappears off the screen was mm -hmm. one of the last presenters of the of the old regime so symbolically he kind of vanishes in real time and i'd oh, never yeah. even really noticed that before yeah. even, you know yeah. looking at the same picture for 30 years and he'd seen some tiny detail that was mm. relevant to him because he mm. knew the context and i hadn't even really noticed it and that's one of the things i love about photography that you can you know you can read a picture you can look at a picture thousands of times and still find something new in it and, and somebody else can find something new in it that you've never really noticed before yeah we're sort of having a, a whirlwind tour of the, uh, of the collapse of the Eastern Bloc, but before we come to Yugoslavia, um, and because that is one of the major stories in your career, can you just take us through your experience in Chechnya? I mean, I personally remember that being, uh, in some ways, the most brutal. Fast forward a little bit. That's not quite the sequence I've got the slides in. Is oh, that okay. okay? The next okay. one I've yeah, got, no, I think, sure. is the Kazakhstan story, if that's okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, not so, yeah, so the, the, the story that um, sort of, I mean, so the, basically what was happening around this time in terms of my career is I was still very young, but I'd been taken on uh, by network, as you, as you mentioned, through Barry Lewis, who is a great, fantastic mentor of mine. And I was young and energetic and, and shooting colour. And in those days, there weren't that many British photographers shooting colour news. So I got quite a good reputation as being a kind of colour, current affairs news photographer working in slide and so on. And I started working with The European, which was Robert Maxwell's ill-fated publication. Um, and through them, got an assignment to go out and photograph um, in Kazakhstan as it was breaking up, as the Soviet Union was breaking up, a big anti-nuclear demonstration because Kazakhstan was where the Soviet Union tested its nuclear weapons. And I managed to, I went out there with the newspaper for a couple of days to cover this demonstration and this big rally. And then realized it was a really amazing story because uh, I was, I was able, we, they took us out to what was ground zero of the nuclear testing um, po uh, program in, in the Soviet Union. So I went back a couple of months later and spent about a month photographing the impact and the aftermath of the new Soviet nuclear testing program um, and what, mm -hmm. what, what that had left, the, the legacy had left on Kazakhstan. So this was, <coughs> excuse me, I managed to get my way into the secret Soviet town of Semipalatinsk, which was where all the scientists, the nuclear scientists lived, mm. and convinced um, this Russian officer over through a bottle of vodka to take me right out to what had been ground zero. So this strange sort of submarine conning tower in the background was one of the monitoring stations they'd used to collect all the data from the nuclear explosions. And so I photographed the impact that it had on the, on the, the families and the civilians living in the area. Um, this yeah. was a group of kids playing on a, a sculpture that was like a giant nucleus. And it was a, it was a tough story to do because, you know, there were some really horrific, uh, and you'll come to a moment, I'm going to go over them quite quickly because they are quite, quite uh, graphic. But there were some really horrific uh, cancers and tumours and mm. uh, other mm. impacts that this had had on the, on the population. And again, this is, this is kind of one of the stories that established me as a journalist as much as a, as a sort of news photographer, because it was published pretty widely uh, in, in the Observer magazine, I think, and in, in America, and a couple of other stories, and, and so on and so forth. So that really established my, and it won a World Press Award. Uh, so that kind of yeah. really got my career, gave my career a huge boost in those early days. This was a father. So this young boy was suffering from leukemia, and his mother had just passed away from cancer as well. And his father was trying to take care of him. It was a terribly sad, uh, terribly sad situation. Yeah. Um, so the year that you won the award, this was the first prize in the Nature Stories for the Kazakhstan. Uh, nature and the Environment, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. right, yeah. Yeah, and I also won the, the award won for the general the story. Story, which is the yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that was, an, that was an amazing year for you. It was, yeah, it was extraordinary. Um, I mean, it was also when I first went to, to Sarajevo. So all in the same year, all these different things were happening. And that was one of the strange things about covering the Yugoslavian war is we would go in for a while, you know, work for a couple of weeks, come out again, go back in mm -hmm. again, come back out again, go and do other stories in the meantime, you know, Somalia and then Rwanda and, 
and so on and so forth. So it was quite quite a quite a trip, um, you know. And I think um, it was. I mean, it is very strange working in this kind of field because you are you are doing some pretty weird things. When we, if we're honest about it, you know, you're going backwards and forwards between these places and coming back home again. And it can be quite a strange, disconcerting sort of jump between those two spaces. Now, mm. I was very lucky. I had some very good friends and they were able to understand what was happening without necessarily having to kind of really talk about it too much. So it was really supportive. Mm. I had some very mm. good friends and we had some good evenings where we would dance all of that tension and energy away, I have to admit, back in those times. Um, as I said, what, what I was always looking for in stories were images that sort of symbolized or summed up the story. And for me in Somalia, this was, mm. uh, this was in a situation where it was a famine, but it was a famine, most famines, almost all famines are caused by, by human action. They're caused by geopolitical uh, battles over land and resources and so on. It's very rare they are, inverted commas, purely natural disasters. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, and so for me, this image really sort of summed up that in the history of Somalia, because you've got a you know, it was a very important geopolitical battleground between the Soviets and the Americans, but with the fall of the Soviet Union, that, that ceased to be. And they, they'd armed the country to the teeth with different weapons, and then they kind of banned it to its fate. And so this image sort of summed up that, that legacy of a, it's a Russian, destroyed Russian tank with a big American sort of uh, cruiser stuck mm. on top of it mm. that the mm. kids have turned into a temporary playground. So it seemed to kind of encompass or sum up that whole that whole battleground between America and the uh, the Cold War battles between Reagan and and uh, and, and the Russians. Mm. So this is this is an image that I'm I'm I'm, sitting, I'm I'm quite troubled by in a way, but I'm also part of. And I think that was that's been one of the things that's been a really recurring theme, and it's one of the things I'm so interested in now as a, as more of an academic is you know there is a tension. Um, between the media and the story, the representation and the, the kind of ethics of representation, if you like. And mm. I'd always made photographs of the media at work, um, not, not, not to criticize them because I was very much part of this, you know, a couple of seconds earlier and a couple of seconds later, mm. I, was, I joined this lineup to take the picture as well. But I was very intrigued by kind of opening up this sort of fourth wall as it were and, and stepping back a little bit from time to time. Because it's very easy to look at a photograph uh, and, and not to realize the process by which it's made and, and the kind of story behind it, if you like. So every now and again, I did like to open up that um, and make it more visible, if you like, that these are, these are um, real events. They're not staged, but there is a sort of theatrical element to them mm. as well. I think mm. photography is very performative. And mm. in multiple levels, and there's also different ways in which that is true. But I think the, the role of the media in these situations is very complex and, and very, you really do have to kind of tease it out and think about it. And obviously, we're seeing that absolutely being played out at the moment in, in what's happening with both COVID and obviously the, the Black Lives Matter and, and the protests and so on, um, in terms of, you know, what is our role as, as, as documentarians, as photographers, as media, mm. and so on. Mm. Paul, I've just got a couple of questions um, from the audience, which actually relate to what you're discussing right now. Um, Ali's asked, um, just wondering if your, all of your images or some of your images were candid, um, particularly thinking about the TV screen and the boys looking through the metal barrier. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Yes, they are. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'll show you a couple of pictures in a moment that are uh, portraits and they are posed but all of the pictures I've shown you so far were shot in the real time. I mean, you know, you are making connections with people, you're making eye contact, you're interacting with them very often through body language and through, you know, a lot of time in, there's in a lot, you know, you, you don't necessarily, I mean, one of the problems with this kind of work is if you stop somebody and say, can I take your picture? That does sort of break that fourth wall that we talked about. It, it sort of breaks that, that kind of, on the other hand, sometimes you do need to do that. You know, obviously working in the story in Kazakhstan, almost all those situations were negotiated the access. You know, I, I I'd, was working with a fixer, with a translator, and we'd agreed that we could go in and spend time with that particular family. And then you just let things unfold in front of you. Um, but, you know, a lot of the time you're doing it through body language and you're kind of looking at somebody the way you catch somebody's eye or the way that you are, um, are able to um, just enter into a situation kind of gently and quietly and hoping that people will allow you in. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Paul. I've got one more question from Liz Kenny, who says, um, in many of your images, you're very close to the action and appear to have total trust of the protagonists. How much has the attitude of participants in street action to photographers changed 
And what do you think are the main reasons for this? Um, you mean in terms of state? Yeah, that's a difficult question because I think, you know, if you look at I know Dylan Martinez's picture, that amazing photograph he, he took just a couple of days ago, clearly he was right in the heart of the action as well. I mean, I got, I got bottled, I got smashed up, I got hit by the police in, in the Poltax riots in, in, in 88. Um, so I don't think it's necessarily that it's, it's changed. I think that, um, the, we're, you know, the journal, again, as I said before, me, the media are always in a very difficult position because we are very often are literally sandwiched between the, um, you know, in a demonstration, for example, between the police and the protesters and certainly covering things like whopping and the, you know, the early day, the late, the end of the miners' strike and certainly the poll tax riot, you know, you, have, you very much felt that and that's 30 years ago. So I don't think that's necessarily changed. I mean, I think it is very, I mean, clearly at the moment, there, especially in America, there are some very, very clear violations of press freedom and very, very clear attacks on the press, deliberate attacks by the forces of law and order. And that is extremely troubling and we really do have to resist that and we have to make sure that that is fought and that people are being supported in that because you know clearly it's that the press have to be there we have to be able to be independent witnesses and we have to be able to take account and hold people to account on both sides of these situations on all sides in fact because you you had three different sides if you like in the demonstrations in london the other day um it's difficult and you know and it's it's and i really you know i'm not doing this kind of work at the moment anymore and I, but i'm really proud of my colleagues who are doing that uh, they are taking risks clearly but, you know, they are hopefully calculated risks and they are hopefully, you know, but they don't deserve to be directly targeted and directly attacked. That's certainly the case. And I think that's, that's happening now on a scale that didn't happen before. There were individual moments. There were moments when a policeman might lash out. You know, David Hoffman would be very much able to testament to that, who's been, you know, covering these kind of events for a long time and, and you know, has, has won cases against the police for brutality uh, back in the 80s. So it's not a new thing, sadly, but we are definitely seeing a higher, a higher level of it now. And that is extremely troubling. And I think we've really got to try to fight back against that and resist that. And my last question for now, um, before I disappear again, is from Daniel Norwood, who asks, do you see your role as a photographer to affect change or just to bear witness to the event? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think it's up to each individual person to, 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 to decide their own set of ethics, if you like. And I think it's important you decide these things before you start working. It's too late after the event to say, oh, ooh, well, why was I doing that? Oh, really? Oh, gosh. So I think you need to think carefully in advance about what are you trying to do in this situation? Uh, I was always quite partisan. I always had an axe to grind, if you like. I always felt there was something that I wanted to say about the situation that I was witnessing or that I was photographing. Um, and this is a good example, which I'll, I'll come to in a moment with Chechnya. And I think it's, I think you don't have to do that. Um, you know, you can claim inverted commas objectivity, although I think we all know that's, that's actually a bit of a myth. But for me, some of the most powerful work comes from a real passion and commitment and a, a, a very, in a sense, subjective approach because you care about it. You have a, something that you want to say. Gio Perez puts it very well, I think. Uh, he, he's got a great line about by being relentlessly self-doubting and relentlessly subjective and relentlessly questioning what you're doing, you actually end up becoming kind of objective because you're so you're thinking about what you're doing so much that you're sort of forcing yourself to work through the questions and the problems that you're facing ethically around these situations. So I think if, um, as I said, I think it's important that people do have a point of view, um, but I think it's also important that you report as accurately and as honestly as you can within that. But certainly, I think you can obviously say, I think there's a lot of issues around this sort of, he said, she said, both sides are equally uh, guilty, can't, or both sides deserve equal representation. You know, when you're dealing with genocide and fascists and extreme violations of human rights, I think, you know, that doesn't, that doesn't work. You can't say, oh, both sides have got a, a point when one side is genocidal. Um, does that make sense? Great. Absolutely. Very good. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to save any questions for a later break, but if you've got any more questions uh, as attendee, just pop it in the Q&A box and I shall disappear now for a short while and come back later. Thanks, Thanks Thank very you. much. Really great questions coming in. Yeah, um, no, really, really good. Keep mm -hmm. sending your questions in. I'll interrupt you soon later on. <laughs> Don't worry. We will, be, we will be coming back to some of those themes 
later as well. So, um, yeah, sure. so, so we're now back in Chechnya, which is where we, we yeah. were, you were asking yeah. about earlier on. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, I went out to Chechnya, um, not knowing a huge amount about Chechnya. I'd worked by that point quite a lot in, in the former Soviet Union and in what become Russia. Um, and, but I was also, this was at the same time as I've been covering the siege of Sarajevo, which we'll come to in a moment. And so I found some affinities or some connections, if you like, with a group of uh, people that were trying to resist aggression from a, a sort of large national superpower uh, who were predominantly Muslim, who were trying to fight for their, their, what they thought was their freedom. And again, you know, I always try to approach these situations to try and tell a story. And the story I wanted to tell was who are the Chechens? Because nobody really knew. I mean, obviously within the Soviet Union they did or in Russia they did, but even outside of that, there wasn't really a great sense of who these people were, what they were fighting for, why they were fighting, what was happening. And there are those rare, there are those rare moments as a journalist where you find yourself essentially the only one there. Well, not, I mean, not the only one, but there were very, very few photographers yeah. and journalists, yeah. for that matter, in Chechnya during the first Russian invasion. And it's one of the few times when I really have felt if I wasn't there, then these things wouldn't have been documented. Um, and those are the moments when you really do think, yes, you know, what we do is is needed and what we do is really important. And I stuck with it. You know, I stayed for about a month at the height of the initial battles. And then when, but when the kind of enough people came and the second wave, as it were, arrived in early January, I felt like I'd done my job and I could leave. But, you know, I did feel mm. a really strong commitment to this story as it was unfolding. Can I, can I just ask you something about that? Because, I mean, my memory of Chechnya was that it was terrifying. Um, it was such an obliteration of Grozny and um, yeah. it just seemed everybody who was there uh, was in danger of dying. Now, yeah. obviously as a, as a conflict, I'm not saying you are a conflict photographer, but in terms of covering conflicts, going to war, you're necessarily going to put yourself in danger. But perhaps in those times there was a, a respect or an understanding that journalists stood apart and that there was a kind of did you think that, that you had something around you that protected you, whereas perhaps now in Syria, for example, that protection no longer exists? Um, to an extent, I mean, obviously there's no protection against a 500 kilogram bomb dropped from a jet fighter, uh, as happened here with this photograph. This was a Russian woman who was, one of the ironies of Chechnya, the Grozny was that the, a lot of the ethnic Chechens had left the city and what was left behind were these ethnic Russians that Stalin had shipped to there in the 40s to try and Russify the country, or that republic rather. And this woman, this is her apartment building in the background there that had been hit by a, a bomb. And she was mm. literally screaming at Yeltsin, uh, you know, what are you doing, you mother, you know, holding yeah. the keys to her apartment that had been destroyed. So yes, but I mean, you know, from the Chechen side, you know, we were absolutely not targeted. We were helped, we were given, you know, they were extremely, you know, happy to have journalists there and very welcoming. And the same was true, certainly in the beginning in, in Sarajevo, for example. Um, but certainly, yes, I mean, I think Syria and, you know, obviously it, it was sort of started in Beirut with kidnappings and, and, and it got even more escalated with Iraq and Afghanistan and Syria. That absolutely direct, that, that scene that a journalist is, is part of the geopolitical game and, and a, a pawn that can be manipulated and, and used for either political or financial gain. Uh, yes, that, that's, I think, a new thing. And I think that's extremely um, uh, scary, obviously. But, you know, on the other hand, you know, we also have to remember that the, the, the majority of journalists who've been killed recently are not, you know, Americans and Brits who've gone to Syria, they're Syrians who are working there. And I think we really have to remember that we've got to respect the incredible work that, that photographers who are living these stories are, are doing, you know, in Palestine, in Syria, in, in Iraq, in Afghanistan. Um, you know, they are paying the price of, of, of their bravery. And, you know, countries like, you know, even Mexico, uh, Colombia, you know, where journalists mm -hmm. are covering these and, and they're being threatened and being kidnapped and being killed. Um, well, certainly in Mexico, the they're being killed. So, so yeah. yeah. In Mexico, they're certainly being killed. Exactly, yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah. So this was an elderly Russian couple who, who their house had been destroyed by a bomb and husband had been killed and his wife was mourning over his body. And this was yards away from the, the little pension that we'd been staying in. Uh, we were sleeping and this huge explosions kind of shook the little hotel we were staying in and we came out in the early morning and found this devastating scene sort of around us. Um, these are young guys, young lads waiting for the first wave of Russian tanks to, to come into the city with their homemade Molotov cocktails in vodka bottles. Um, 
And they gave the Russians a pretty nasty surprise. I think very much like in Vietnam, the, the Russians thought they would just roll in with the tanks and the APCs and, and uh, mm. meet very little resistance. But actually the Chechens were really tough, very seasoned, very smart. And they destroyed the first waves of, of Russian tanks that came into the city um, with pretty horrific results. You can see this Russian armored personnel carrier that had been hit by an RPG and the crew literally were incinerated. Yeah. And this was this was uh, this is what this is the picture that made me stay in Chechnya during that period. Really, it was a uh, we'd heard there'd been a bombing attack on one of the suburbs of the city. Uh, we went out to go and check it out in the early morning, and there'd been uh, a couple of houses been blown up by by bombs. From, uh, and then the jets came screaming in again and 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 launched another round of of high explosives and killed I think twenty two people. And it was very clearly a civilian area. There was no military target there whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And Yeltsin at the time, you know, and Yeltsin was, at, you know, kind of seen quite favorably in, in the West, but he was, he was saying, oh, we're only attacking uh, military targets, you know, we're only attacking these guerrillas. Mm -hmm. And this clearly was a, an absolute violation of, of that. And it was clearly an attack on a purely civilian area. So, you know, I was thinking, I, I remember literally thinking as I was taking this picture, you know, this is evidence of a war crime. Not that it was ever prosecuted, to be honest, but, you know, this is important. Mm -hmm. This has to be told. Mm -hmm. This story has to get out. Mm -hmm. So this is an image that I've always, um, that's, you know, become, I suppose, one of my sort of signature images. And it's one that always sort of, um, again, it's one I can come back to a lot. And to me, it, if it sums up a lot of what I think photography does. Um, I know, I know Susan Sontag always famously said that photographs don't narrate, but I think that's, I, I would disagree quite vehemently with that. And I think for me, photography is about time uh, mm -hmm. more than anything else, really. And it's about, um, I think Simon, uh, Simon Norfolk used in the title of his Afghanistan book, The Chronotype, which is this back then's mm -hmm. idea of when space and time are kind of fused together and create this sort of temporal, almost temporal black hole. And photographs, you know, they exist in, a, they're, they're taken in a very specific, precise moment in time, um, in the past. They're always in the past. And yet they mm -hmm. can live into the present and in fact project into the future because we can be looking at them again you know, in 30 years time. This picture is almost 30 years old and, and we're looking at it today. And I think they can also obviously represent a very specific incident, a very specific moment in time, but they can also be more general and, and speak to your larger themes. Um, and for me, this image, you know, there are multiple layers of time, so literally embedded into the fabric of the photograph. Uh, I, we were driving into Chechnya, uh, to Grozny, sorry, because we've been staying in a small village on the outskirts because it become too dangerous to sleep in the city overnight. And we came across a wreckage of a car that had been shot up by a gunship, helicopter gunship, and there, mm. was, there was nobody around. But we looked, we jumped out of our car, I looked down, almost on autopilot, I took a couple of frames. Uh, we, didn't, we never found out what had happened, what the story was, you know, mm. jumped back in our car and drove off again because we were afraid we might get um, attacked. And then I sent the film back to ship, I mean, ship the film back. I mean, that's the other amazing thing. Imagine, you know, can you imagine that in those days we used to go to an airport with a bag of film and mm. find a friendly looking passenger in the check-in queue and say, excuse me, uh, you know, my name's Paul, though. I'm a photographer working for, you know, Magnum Agency and uh, would you mind carrying this film back to England for me? And when you arrive at Heathrow, a, a motorcycle courier will meet you at the airport. He will, you know, say thank you very, very much and off it will go. Yeah. Imagine yeah. that today, it's absolutely absurd. But yes, that's yeah. what we did in those days. That you had to ship your film out, you know, to get it out. And um, Chris Boot, who was then the editor of my editor at Magnum, he saw mm. this frame on the, uh, on the deck of the light box and the slides. And I hadn't really even registered making the picture, to be honest with you. But he'd sit, he saw it and realized it was a strong picture. And it, it, indeed, it became, you know, it was quite widely published in, in the magazine mm. stories that were mm. published around yeah. that time. Um, mm. But as I said, you've got this kind of literal layering of time in the image. You've got the asphalt of the road and then the snow falls and then the body falls on that and it bleeds out. And then people come to try and help and take the body mm. away. And then I mm. come, take my picture, and then the rain will come and the snow and it will all be washed away and it will just be on the road again. So literally you've mm. got these kind yeah. of multiple yeah. layers of temporality. There isn't a story, you know, in the fabric of the photograph there. Really. Yeah. We're, we're running short of time. So sure. um, I, can we move on to Yugoslavia, which is yes, your absolutely. seminal work? Yeah. Um, with the I'm going to grab a glass of water and come back for a second. Go on, sure. sure. So Paul was in uh, Sarajevo during the siege, and um, 
if you'd like to talk us through that, and you're now writing this book about um, the journalist's intervention in that process. That's right, yeah. Yeah, so I, I first went to Sarajevo um, uh, in June of 1992. Um, and I was really immediately, like many of my generation, you know, this was, you know, this became our Beirut, our Vietnam, if you like, people like uh, Charlotte Eager and Giovanni and Alan Little, mm -hmm. Malcolm Brabant, and photographers like Ron Habib and Gary Knight and so on, where we all, we all kind of met there as young, young journalists um, and grew up together, really. And we were all, I think, captured by this extraordinary human story of a European educated city full of people who you know Monty Python and Only Fools and Horses were really popular uh, TV series in, in Yugoslavia at the time so I remember sort of sitting in bunkers underground lit by candlelight discussing the finer points of the four Yorkshiremen sketch with in fact there was a whole there was even a kind of Bosnian version of Monty Python called Nadalista Surrealista that was their sort of um, surreal, surreal comedy troupe and they did some amazing TV shows you know comedy shows during the war and mm. so it was that sense of, 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 you know, it was almost like a kind of a, a, an experiment in human psychology. It was sort of like taking a city like Edinburgh, for example, there were a lot of physical as well as cultural connections between Edinburgh and Sarajevo and, and putting, taking it back to the Middle Ages, you know, in, in a medieval siege, like something from Lord of the Rings or, or Game of Thrones, mm. you know, where mm. they're encircled on all sides, being shelled, having all water, electricity, gas, food that was cut off. And yet people survive, people found incredible ways to survive and, and indeed in, in strange ways to thrive. Um, so I found that a really incredibly powerful story to tell. And once we were committed to it, we, we kind of stuck with it and we went back and carried on working on it over the years. Um, and so I did a book called Bosnians um, in 2005, which was um, 10 years of, or oh, actually more than 10 years of my coverage, covering the war and very importantly, the post-war period, I think. We don't pay enough attention to what happens before wars and what happens to after wars. Yeah, I think sure. spend a bit more time thinking about why wars break out and then what happens in the post-war period. We're probably a lot better off, really. But um, anyway, yeah. So this is just these are some layouts from the book, just to give you a flavour of how the book. And one thing that was very important to me in the book as well was to make it by the book as much for people from from Sarajevo and from Bosnia as it was for a, an external audience. Um, and one of the things that I, I learned through doing the book was editing um, and how to kind of expand the moment, if you like, and, and not mm -hmm. just look for that one frame that sums up the story. So this was, I mean, I edited these pictures 10 years after they were made. And I realized that this kind of almost cinematic strip was a much better way of representing the ongoing moment, if you like, of the siege. Yeah. And the, and so something was happening all the time rather than just picking out the one key frame. So I did that a couple of times in the book. Mm. This was the body of a young woman who'd been killed by a sniper um, and she'd obviously painted her toenails before she'd gone out that day, which was to me a really powerful symbol of the resistance because women there, you know, ironically the, 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 the worst dressed and sort of smelliest women in the city were the journalists. Um, the, the locals were always very disparaging of the all the yeah. fixers, a lot of the, the journalists worked with fixers uh, who were from the city and they were always telling off the, the female journalists for not putting their makeup on and not, not looking good. Because, uh, you know, women there used that as a form of resistance. Uh, as yeah. artists did, as musicians did, as filmmakers did, they did what they did. They were, they were, they made art, they made music, they made theatre, even in the height mm. of the siege. Um, and I learned a lot about, as I said, in that book, one lesson that I would certainly say to anybody out there who's a photographer is, Go back and mine your archive periodically. Go back and look again at work that you made in the past because you'll suddenly find all sorts of images that you never really noticed before. So when I did the Bosnians book, about 60 to 70% of the pictures I ended up using from the war period, I hadn't even noticed on the contact sheets uh, the first time around because I was editing mm -hmm. with a different, different perspective. I was looking for the news picture at the time. Yeah. And yeah. so this image, for example, which I really love now, it's my little sort of Degar, Degar's girl, one, this little ballerina girl was one that I hadn't even marked up on the contact sheet in the first round of editing, but now it's one of my sort of favorite pictures from that period. Yeah. Pictures have very different um, purposes, don't they, according to where they are being used. Absolutely. So in a newspaper, it's either speaking to the headline or it's got to have an impactful quality of its own. Whereas in Absolutely. a book, it can flow and be more reflective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I've yeah. become really interested in that. I mean, with my own, with this work from Bosnia, um, 
I mean, you know, there were lots of us here and we all made important work. I, I did do a lot of work on how the civilian population survived the siege. Um, and I think that's an important body of work. And, and now it's had these multiple lives, which I find really interesting. So initially there were news pictures meant really for a Western audience. Mm -hmm. And then I made, you know, still, still with quite a strong photographic, journalistic sort of narrative storytelling bent, I did the book and selected pictures to try and tell the story more in a more expanded way. But now I'm looking at this archive with a different viewpoint, which is who are the people in the pictures? You know, what does it mean to them? You know, going back and trying to look for some of these people, um, you know, maybe that's the only photograph they have of themselves during the war or this kind of quite, quite ethnographic almost uh, approach in a way. So I think it's very interesting how the same photograph can take on. So now if I go back and look at contact sheets, I'm no longer looking for, is it a great photograph? I'm looking for who's in the picture and what, what, what are the details in that image? And I think that's again, the re I mean, I'm working quite a lot now with historians, uh, as I said, coming back to that. And one of my things I'm trying to do is educate uh, non-photographic academics in the value of photography. So not just using it for a purely descriptive, kind of decorative, illustrative, uh, but actually use, it, use photographs as tools to think with and analyze and make sense of these situations as well. Mm. Mm. As I said, we're short, going short of time, so I'm going to skip through some of this. Just one thing I wanted to talk about a little bit was the missing, because that was a really important part of the story, and that was what brought me to finish to do the book, actually, was um, covering what had happened to the, uh, the, 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 the 20,000 or 30,000 people who's been killed, bodies had not been recovered after the war. Mm. Um, and so I went out and spent a lot of time with the Bosnian Commission for Missing Persons, um, looking for the, the remains of these, the exhumation remains of, of these victims, which is a very powerful, um, very emotional, very powerful story to cover. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what you said. So this is from that chapter of the book about the, uh, the victims post-war. And it was interesting because I showed this work to editors and they were like, oh God, are there still people? I didn't realize that was a story. This was five years after the end of the war and people hadn't really registered that, that that there were still 20, 30,000 bodies hidden in graves scattered all over the country. Mm. Mm. It takes on a different power as time passes, doesn't it? Yeah, sort of... absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And actually, this, this was, I shot this back in 2004, this set of pictures, and these houses are pretty much still there, abandoned and destroyed, yeah. um, kind yeah. of like these sort of faces almost in the landscape, paying wit silent witness to the war. I mean, one of the pictures ahead, that has remained in my visual memory is the one where you have the clothes lying on the grass. Yeah. And I coming from a news industry, you this know, one. from a newspaper, looking for that immediate picture all the time, I, it took me a long time to work it, work it out because it's quiet. Yeah. It's a yeah. very gentle. And I was intrigued by the fact that the, the clothes were as a as laid out as a person or two people yeah. in fact just lying side by side That's which right. gave it this immense power and it really taught me how to think differently actually when i saw it i remember that yeah, one particularly yeah, really, yeah. really pleased to hear that and, and that's that was actually a very conscious decision of mine i think you mentioned earlier on about oh there's a question about being right in there in the action um, and definitely in the first sort of part of my career particularly when i was shooting color i really wanted to be a loud photographer if you like i wanted to be right in there and kind of you know in the heart of it, but particularly with this Bosnian work, the post-war work especially, I began to think much more about sort of stepping back and very consciously making kind of quieter pictures that were perhaps more complicated, that were more thoughtful mm -hmm. and slightly, and just allowing space to breathe, if you like, allowing the picture to have its own little sense of, so not yeah. being, you know, inside the picture, being slightly stepping back. And I think yeah. that's a very good observation that you made there. That was definitely what I was trying to achieve with, with these, some of these images, was just that slightly more, uh, distanced view, not mm. not not to distance the viewer, but to kind of set the, set the scene, set the context of the situation. I think a little bit more. Mm. Yes, yeah, so it was quite a conscious decision mm. that. Yeah. Uh, so we just one last set of pictures from Sarajevo, and then I've got a couple from Kosovo, mm. and then we'll come finally to the COVID story. Yeah. I to talk about. Great. Um, Great. One of the things that really struck me about Sarajevo was it's a very beautiful city, and and during the war there was even a very strange kind of aesthetic to the destruction. And so on one of my trips out there, um, I took a large format panoramic camera and a Hasselblad. And there was a period when there were some ceasefires that allowed us to get to areas of the city, the frontline areas that were too dangerous to get to otherwise. So I was able to make some, some photographs of this 
the landscape of the, the destruction, the kind of fabric, the texture of the destruction. And I think, you know, looking back, this is some of the most important work I made there because this is completely different now. These scenes don't exist anymore. Obviously, it's all been rebuilt and reconstructed. Mm -hmm. And I work mm -hmm. a lot with the Historical Museum in Sarajevo uh, on various projects. And I'm very happy that some of this work is going to be going into their museum, hopefully, when they do a rebuilding of it. Um, and some quite abstract images like this, obviously. This, is a, this was a sniper curtain that had been held across the street. So one of the, there were people very inventive at ways of designing um, ways to survive, if you like. So this was a giant sheet of, of cloth that had been strung on a wire between two apartment buildings because even though mm. it's not offering any physical protection to bullets, it offers visual protection because if a sniper can't see you, then he can't shoot at you. And so this kind of quite interesting, quite abstract image has become very important. So the museum's going to be using this in, a, in a, they're going to be using it almost life size. So the picture will be, I think, about four meters square. Wow. On the, on yeah. the entrance to the museum, which is going to look amazing when we... When yeah. We yeah. Um, and this was a funny story. This, I just have one quick funny story about this, and then we'll move on to, to, to oh. Kosovo. Um, I shot, when I shot this picture, this was in 94, and it was just behind the Holiday Inn, uh, the hotel where all the journalists stayed in. And I remember when I saw this collection of cars, um, I thought, God, so this is really interesting. Somebody designed that. Somebody made that barricade really, really carefully, kind of OCD. And it's also like a little history of Yugoslav cars because you've got all the different makes and brands of, of cars that were sold in the 1980s and so on. Mm. Uh, anyway, last year I was teaching a workshop in Sarajevo with a group of architecture students from Delft University and my students from, from LCC. And the woman who was co-organizing with me had invited a local uh, Bosnian Sarajevan architect to give a talk about wartime architecture. And he started giving his presentation and he said, well, you know, he's now quite well established, quite famous architect who I, I'd heard of uh, anyway. And he said, well, during the war, I was a young graduate and, and my job was civil defense. And so I used to help build barricades. And he put a slide up, not of, of the same barricade as this. So, I, you know, back in 93, I designed this barricade. So I finally got to meet the the man, he was very OCD and very precise and very kind of architectural. So I know, I know that I can name the person, um, uh, Nihad Cengic, who, who built this barricade back then. And that's one of the wonderful things about Sarajevo. It's, uh, you know, you're constantly meeting people that you have a connection with from the story. And that's why still living here is so important to me. Yeah. Great. So, so let's, let's just pictures. go to Kosovo, where, where you... Was it the beginning of starting to change from being? Yeah, it's kind of the beginning, beginning of the end, if you like. Yeah, mm. I mean, I had a sort of, I suppose, a bit of a Damascus moment in in Kosovo. Um, you know, I was very successful. I was with Magnum. I, I was covering all these big stories, and you know, um, but I'd always had, as I said earlier on, that image that I showed from Somalia of the press. I'd always mm. had a little bit of an unease about uh, the role of the media. Um, it's a very double-edged. You know, it's a very kind of problematic situation. And that really came at to head to a head to me in Kosovo. Um, you know, I was on the border between Albania. I'd, I'd gone out with the specific idea to shoot portraits of the refugees as they came over the border with whatever they were carrying. Um, mm -hmm. uh, what, you know, you're given five minutes to leave your house, a guy with a ski mask is holding you at gunpoint and saying, get out, what do you bring with you? What's the most valuable thing that you bring? And everybody can relate to that. It's like if your house is burning down, you know, what do you grab? So I found a fix to help me translate. I took a Hasselblad medium format and we would stop people and ask them, you know, people looked interesting visually, you know, what did you bring with you? So this old man, his mother was crippled and so he knew they were going to be forced at some point to walk. So he brought a wheelbarrow with him so he could carry his mother across no man's land mm. between Albania and Macedonia. Um, this man brought his tractor, literally piled everything in there, the kitchen sink onto his tractor and all his family's belongings and so on. Uh, this woman, she was pregnant, so she carried her baby over the border and gave birth just after she'd arrived in, in, in Albania. Wow. Um, this was a young, was a doctor, um, and the Serbs were taking all the ID cards and passports of the Kosovan Albanians as they were, as they were deporting them and, and, and cleansing them and burning them because that would, it would make it much more difficult for them ever to come back because they couldn't prove their nationality. But he managed to hide his driver's license in his underpants. And so we took him to the Red Cross and we got him a job as a, as a driver for the Red Cross. And this woman would have brought her, her traditional clothing. And this old man, I asked him what he brought and he just put his hands out and said, Nishta, which means nothing. 
And by this point, I'd, I'd met my wife, uh, who's from Sarajevo, Amra, and we got married. And I spoke enough of the language to be able to communicate with people. And I was really struck that had things gone differently, this could have been the people of Sarajevo. They could have been cleansed and evicted and murdered en masse. And I felt a very powerful kind of connection to that. And I was standing on the border. These people are coming across devastated. They've lost everything. And the first thing they see is not an aid worker or someone's help. It's a whole lineup of journalists and saying, how do you feel and taking photographs and so on. And I'm not saying that's not that we shouldn't be doing that, but it did make me question what my role as an individual photographer was. Was I so, was I so uh, immodest to think that Paul Lowe's contribution to this is so important that you know, I have to tell the story? So, because there were a lot of other amazing people there, there were fantastic photographers there already, you know, and I was part of that group. So my contribution was just a little bit extra. Did, did it really make that much difference? I have no idea. So I decided then to sort of shift tack and either do stories where nobody else was doing it, or actually, in fact, I realized that I could probably do more by working as an educator and as a teacher and as a writer than as a photographer. And so that was a kind of big sea change for me, really, which led me into, into teaching and into um, my time at LCC, where, I, where I've been now for 15 years, which is kind of scary. I was in a meeting with a colleague the other day, and she said, oh, you're one of the, you've been here a long time, haven't you, you know, asking for advice. I said, no, I haven't, no, I've just joined. And then I realized it was, it's been 15 years as an educator, which is rather scary. Uh, but yes, there we are. And that, that brings us pretty much up to, to today. Obviously, there's a big jump here. But, you know, I don't really make photographs very much anymore. I do a few things for myself, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, but I really, but I'm fascinated by the medium and I spend most of my energy now on write, thinking and writing and researching. Um, and I'm slowly moving more into that role, even more than into teaching. I mean, I've got PhD students now that I supervise, but my sort of day-to-day -day hands-on teaching is getting less and my research and writing and critical writing, I suppose, is, is getting more and more important as I'm coming into my middle age, as, they, as, uh, as, as Clint Eastwood said, at the age of 65, I'm, I'm just beginning to enter middle age. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so let's just think about the teaching. One of the things that you were an early adopter of was online Absolutely. education. 2008, yeah. you set up the online MA course yeah. at LCC. Um, Ten years ago, technology was very different. Obviously, we've got Zoom now. Who knew about Zoom, you know? I didn't read it um, before I told you. <laughs> but um, uh, could you just talk a little bit about how you set set mm -hmm. it up ten years yeah. ago? What your what your technical challenges as well as the educational? Well, but what I'm really interested in is having had ten years of experience. Students are now being faced with this digital online teaching yeah. platform yeah. that they are going to have to embrace, sure. and whether you think that's okay. Well, um, obviously I do because I wouldn't be teaching that way. But yes, no, no. I mean, but what I mean you know, is you losing that sort of um, yeah, yeah, sure contact. Well, I, I mean, yeah, I've got some quite strong feelings about that. Obviously, I mean, the irony <laughs> is that uh, the technology that we use to deliver our course hasn't changed at all. We use live. We started. We were one of the very first in, uh, um, adopters, if you like, of live web conferencing, um, and we've stuck with it all the way through. And so the the heart of the of the MA. So we have the full-time version, which is in London, and we have the part-time online version, which is fully online. There's no face-to-face -face contact whatsoever. And it's delivered in, almost entirely through live web conferencing. So we, you, we've used a platform or various different iterations of what's now called Blackboard Collaborate, which is a bit like Zoom, except it's more academically focused. But we've been using that since 2008 or something like that. Um, so we're actually, we're a very early adopter of, of what everybody else is. I mean, I keep on saying to people now, welcome to my world. I've been sort of working in this space now for a long time. Mm -hmm. And the reason I set the course up or established it was I realized that the bulk of my interactions professionally as a photographer, which I still was then, were digital. You know, the days when you would go into the office with a bag of film and process it, or mm -hmm. you would even take a portfolio in had gone almost all the connect contact I had with editors and with magazines and with agencies was was digital you know was either shooting digitally or emailing or you know skyping people and so on and given that was what was happening in the professional world I thought well, why can't we try and do something that replicates that in the academic world so that was the kind of driving force and I was aiming at what I call mid-career professionals if you like which were people who were predominantly established in a field, whether that's photography or not. In fact, I, one of the interesting things about our course is that the majority of people that have done the course, and we've had hundreds and hundreds over the years, 
don't have a first degree in photography. They are, I actually set it up for people like me, to be perfectly honest. I set it up for people that have done a sort of liberal, art, liberal arts, you know, degree mm. about something kind of interesting, history, politics, economics, anthropology, whatever, who then went off and did a conversion course, which was the same as David's. And I, I have to oh, say to David, Hearn, and Daniel Meadows, and Patrick Sutherland, and all those other people who, who taught me back in the 80s, what a huge legacy and how important they've been and the legacy they've led. I mean, the, our course is sort of the bastard child in some ways of the, of the Gwent College, uh, the Newport course. We used to use a lot of the same methodologies, people at work and relationships and establishing shots and things like that, because I think they work really well still as a methodology. Um, so yeah, so that's, that, I find that really interesting. We get an incredible variety of different types of backgrounds of people on the course. In fact, there's quite a lot of people in the audience I can see who are either graduates of the course or currently even studying on it. And it's been an amazing journey, incredibly fulfilling to work with, uh, with such an incredible range of people mm -hmm. and watch their transformations. And I, I, you know, looking back now, I, I think I can say the course has an amazing legacy and it's produced some really incredible photographers and, and we're obviously doing something right because I think we've seen time and time again how we've been able to really help people. I was talking about this to, the other day to one of my current students and I said, I think, I think what we found is a way to help people find that thing inside themselves they didn't really know that was there, but it was always there but they didn't quite realize it. And we often mm -hmm. see some really radical transformations of, of people who come on the course who do a complete 180 and discover something in, in photography that, that they hadn't realized was there before. And they find a whole new way of working, which is tremendously exciting as, a, as an educator to, to, to feel that's, that, that, that's happening. So yeah, but as I said, I mean, I, I, to be honest, it, I, it's a slightly bittersweet experience at the moment um, because education you know, suddenly flipped and suddenly oh, everything was online. We could have been doing this and we should have been doing this 10 years ago. Um, you know, and I, I would, I would, I would even critique my own uh, institution, to be honest. And hope, you know, even if somebody's listening in, I've said this quite openly in meetings already, so I'm, not, I'm happy to say it again. You know, we kind of missed the boat in many ways. That this, this shouldn't have been such a great shot. We should have been doing this anyway. It should have, you know, the the, the digital analog interface, if you like, because in the professional world, it's pretty seamless. I mean, you know, when you're working yeah. out in the field, yeah. if you're working yeah. within a, a digital lab, if you're working in a design studio if you're working in a museum, almost every context, this is normal, you know, the, the, there is just a sort of, you know, we're living this multiple identity of a digital life and, a, and, a, and an analog life. So it shouldn't have come as such a shock. We should have been better prepared for it. We should have, it should have been something that we were already doing and it shouldn't have been such a great kind of, oh my God, we are all gonna go online now. Um, so, you know, obviously I'm Mr. Popular at the moment because I've a lot of experience of it. But what I say to you know, people is if you can write an email and you can have a phone conversation with somebody, then you can teach online because it's, <laughs> in a sense, it's not much more difficult than that. I think what I found really interesting about that, the experience um, is that I think we genuinely can create a very intimate and very powerful uh, interaction online. I don't think you need to sit in the same room as somebody to be able to really connect with them. And in fact, that would be interesting to see, I mean, that certain, this is feedback we've had from you know, cohorts of students is that there is a different kind of intimacy, but it's, 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 it's still very intimate. Uh, you know, when we're in a, we don't use the webcam in, in teaching, because actually I find it quite distracting, and I think it's, it, it occupies bandwidth mentally. And when you don't have a webcam on, and you've got a headset on, and you're listening to a group of people talk about their work in really a really deep and meaningful way, a profound way, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you're sort of mentally, you're, you're somewhere in the, in, in the ether, mentally with them. You know, you've got somebody in China, somebody in Japan, somebody in San Francisco and somebody in London. And you're all in this little audio oral world somewhere up, you know, being bounced off a satellite in, in, the, in, in one of the whatever spheres of the earth it is. It's an incredibly, for me, an incredibly intimate space, um, particularly if you're wearing a headset. And I think that's one of the tricks to it, really. I always, when I'm teaching, okay. I'm not wearing one now, but I always wear a headset because then the person's voice is kind of in my head. It's not mm -hmm. disembodied, if you like. Mm -hmm. And I found that very, very powerful. And I've had some of, I, I would argue I have more powerful interactions, tutorial interactions with my online students than I do often with, with, with students in, in the face-to-face -face world. So I'm a great believer in the pedagogy, if you like, and the philosophy of, of the virtual way of working. It, to me, it's not a lesser space at all. It's different, but you know, and the, the proof of the pudding of that is the, the, grad, the, the, the uh, grades that our part-time and full-time students get on the two versions of the course are practically 
indistinguishable. And oh, right. okay. So you can't say, you know, oh, the online course doesn't do as well or vice versa, or the full-time mm. courses. Uh, you know, they're both pra practically indistinguishable. And that's over 15 years now of teaching. Yeah. Well, that, that's really heartening to hear. Because I know that... I've, um, I've got a great, students... I've got a great, we've got a great quote here from Sarah Sturk. Thank you so much, sir, who says that she can yeah. say the course is fantastic. So there you go. Yeah, you yeah, no, I've been watching That's the chat. That's not a plan, that in. wasn't a plan. So Sarah was no, a no. great student. <laughs> yeah, no, the chats have been coming in and saying that they really, really enjoy the online. Yeah. Which is good to know, because I know that there are some students that have been sort of, they've asked me what I thought about taking a year off or sure. you know, deferring and because sure. the online is going to, change their experience yeah, uh, well i mean that, that to me is the tragedy of it that we should not have been in this situation we shouldn't be having to say to students that you're going to have a lesser experience because it should just mm -hmm. be normal this should have been how mm -hmm. we do it anyway um, mm -hmm. and that's the great tragedy of it i mean the, you know we've been massively unprepared in every level as a society both uh you know everywhere almost for for, for the impact of the pandemic but i yeah. think in education and it's going to really bite us badly we're going to take a huge financial hit you know everybody is obviously photographers mm. are taking it mm. you know it, the academic world is going to be absolutely devastated financially because of the loss of fees and that it didn't need to have happened in as quite as badly as that because mm. you know we could have had a very different offer that would have still been very very good i mean what i've been trying to say to colleagues and to my and obviously with my online students, it doesn't really make any difference. It's just business as usual for us, is that we always were. But for the for the face-to-face -face students, it's just make it a digital term. Embrace the digital and look yeah. at what the yeah. affordance. Don't say, what am I missing from not mm. being able to go in the darkroom? Mm. Say, what can I do digitally that I couldn't do in the real world? So really make, take advantage of it and do things that you perhaps couldn't do if you were trying to put your energy into something else. Yeah. I Just looking at the COVID, so it's sort of <clears throat> positive, positive message about... Um, the educational aspects of the, the influence COVID is going to have. But one of the things that um, has been disturbing me for a while, uh, certainly as an editor and the reduction of images, is the, um, the photographer's access to subjects. So it's becoming, in my experience, more and more limited. Images mm -hmm. of children, almost yeah. impossible to do. Um, oh. Increasingly, people object to being photographed in the street. Mm -hmm. In the UK, the privacy laws in all but name have come into effect. Um, so this requirement under COVID to isolate and socially distance, do you think that's going to impact on the photographer's ability to actually work, mm, um, mm. find the stories and, and look outside themselves for their stories? Um, I think it's, I think it's just really, really interesting. I, I really wish it hadn't happened obviously, because it's a horrific thing to be happening to us. Mm -hmm. But in terms of the history of photography, if I kind of step back from it and, and step back from the, the terrible death and economic hardship and put my sort of critical academic hat on, it's actually a really extraordinary moment in the history of photography because there's almost never been a moment when anybody that works in the visual realm is affected by this everywhere in the world. It's almost like a mass experiment where we set the entire world a job. How can you represent what's happening to you through the camera? And everybody's found their own way to do that. You know, some people are working as, you know, obviously frontline photojournalists. Uh, we've got someone like David Collier, for example, who is an amazing photographer, who's actually an, uh, works as an anaesthetist in the NHS and was a very good kind of, you know, um, I, I don't want to say amateur photographer, just a very good photographer, working classically, black and white, like a, you know, small camera format. And he realized, you know, he'd, he'd already before I negotiated access to his hospital to, to document its life anyway, because uh, he was mm -hmm. a keen photographer. Although actually, you know, his professional job is working in, in, the, in the theater, in the, in the, opera, in the operating theater. Um, and so he started documenting his colleagues. He realized that by turning his little, he had a little pocket point and shoot film camera and he was photographing his colleagues, you know, the NHS staff. And he's produced an extraordinary body of work, absolutely fantastic images. Um, and, you know, he responded incredibly powerfully to the challenge of how do we make sense of this thing that's happening to us. And I think almost every photographer has tried to take that on board. Um, so some people obviously have been making quite journalistic work. They've just done what they normally do, but they've turned that on to their own communities very often or their own lives. Other people have found some incredible ways to document the minutiae of their everyday life. Um, some people have made incredible self-portraits and, and they found ways, incredibly creative ways to represent and make sense of their experience. People have used it as a way to help them mentally get through it, psychologically get through it, definitely. 
Um, some people have been very clear at documenting. They've made incredible bodies of documentary work. You know, Peter Turnley, his work on, on New York is absolutely seminal. It's going to be really important. And I think it's important that as, a, as an industry and as a media, we, we, meant, we capture this and we record this and we try to make sense of it and process it because it is a really incredible moment. Um, as I said, practically everybody that has any form of visual recording device, <laughs> whether that's a phone or a proper camera, is, is using that in the moment. Um, and we're working, I'm working at the moment with a project with format, with the mass isolation format project, with the COVID-19 mm -hmm. project, and with Historic mm -hmm. England. And Historic England had this one week uh, picturing lockdown call that I don't know if anybody saw that. It was quite widely publicized. It was the week, the last week of April, the first week of May. And they got 3,000 entries from inverted commas, the general public. And it's an amazing mm -hmm. set of pictures, incredible photographs of, of people's lives and, and the things they thought were important to document. It's, mm -hmm. you know, it's mass observation. It's back to the 1930s in terms of a kind of yeah. mass movement, as it were, of people recording themselves. Um, and I think it's going to be super important. I mean, it's, it's a, we're, going to, we're going to spend a lot of time trying to make sense of this. Um, certainly in the UK, and we've got, had some really troubling, we've been working a little bit with the, NA, the NUJ and the BPPA. We're beginning, hopefully, some research with them. And there's definitely evidence that, that British photographers particularly were denied access to NHS situations, predominantly by management. And that's really troubling and that's really worrying mm -hmm. because... The NUJ has got a very compelling argument that lack of these powerful images that we were seeing from places like uh, Bergamo and New York in Britain meant people in Britain didn't take it seriously enough, early enough, because they yeah. weren't seeing photographs that were comparable. We, we weren't seeing pictures of coffins, and we weren't seeing pictures of exhausted NHS staff in the way we were seeing them from other countries, predominantly yeah. because we were not allowed to, we weren't given the access. And that mm -hmm. created a kind of black hole in the documentary record which is why it's fantastic that we've had people like David's work. And there have been a couple of other people. I know Stuart Franklin and Simon Townsley just done a great set of pictures uh, in, in one of the wards. But it came quite late in the, mo in the process. By the time we'd kind of realized the, the, what was happening, um, that visual record was gone almost. Mm. So I think there's some really troubling questions. I mean, there's troubling questions all across the board about the way that different countries have responded to this. But there are some very troubling ones about the, how, how, where the photographers have been given access. I think predominantly from what I can see, people have responded to it incredibly creatively and very honestly and very emotionally. And, you know, making sense of this amazing work that's being produced is going to take a generation just to process it and, and, and look at it. Yeah. But there is some fantastic work being made, definitely. Um, my own little you... contribution was quite, yeah. was quite personal. Um, seven, we did, a, we did a personal diaries project. And for quite a long time now, I've been photographing bits of strange things just on my phone really surfaces and strange little things and I, I one of the things i've taken up in the last few years is trail running as a way to keep myself sane and i take my cocker spaniel out in the hills and the mountains quite almost every day for a run and i just started looking at the ground below me um with my phone and just i called it grounded so i just i mean i'm not it's not an amazing set of pictures but it just kept me it kept me sane during that particularly during that kind of intense period when we weren't quite sure where it was going and now thank mm -hmm. you people are easing up a bit so these are just some of the pictures i made uh of you know a pattern of of cow dung on the on the ground some ants uh it was still snow on the ground at that point in sarajevo when i was running on the trails and mm -hmm. i just allowed myself to just flow and and you know peter fraser is a great friend of mine and i'm a huge believer in peter's approach of kind of making a, an instinctive yeah. Uh, yeah. feeling connection with what's around you and I would literally just as I was running along if something triggered of something in my head I'd stop take a picture and carry on running so really just fragments just seconds as I was going along really just looking for shapes and patterns and, and patterns of light on the snow and just got really fascinated with that so very transitory very ephemeral not particularly mm. important but it, it kept me it kept me going psychologically Paul, we're going to finish there. That's fantastic. It's been a real privilege and pleasure to uh, to hear about your your work and particularly the the not just the enthusiasm but the positive future that people can have learning online. Yeah, um, obviously I'm a huge evangelist for it, but yes, absolutely. So um, we're going to open it up for questions. Debbie, have you got questions coming in? I do. I do have a few questions yeah. here, um, which actually one of them um, features your current work about. So you've 
talked about so much of your work has been shot on film. Are you currently shooting on digital? And what do you think about the new digital system in photography? That yeah, so, um, yeah, I'm, not, I, I'm somebody that kind of, in a sense, missed out on digital because I, I was, when I sort of stopped working predominantly professionally, it was sort of in the mid 2000s when film was still, you know, very, very much what we were working with because digital cameras still weren't quite of a good enough quality. And I've only recently, so I sort of between 2000 and sort of five and now, I only ever shot with my phone really. <laughs> I finally bought, I mean, I had, I bought one digital camera ages ago just for kind of everyday stuff, but I just finally bought a little Fuji uh, X100 um, as a digital camera just to carry around with me, a bit like a kind of a digital version of a Leica, I suppose. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's straight, it, it is a kind of, I know, you know, Steve Mays, for example, has written about whether, whether digital, photographs or photographs at all. And, and I think it is very odd. Um, I mean, one of the things I find very intriguing is, you know, what, what are you looking at now? You're looking at a screen, everybody there in, around, whoever, around the world, every the hundred people or so that are in the room with us or on Facebook, you're looking at, you think it's a photograph, you know, what look, it looks like a photograph, it, it, you know, but is it a photograph? Well, you know, it's a bunch of zeros and ones that were, in the world, they're on my phone, they're on my computer, then I've now put them, you know, through Zoom and you're looking at it on your phone or through a screen. It kind of has, it looks like it's a photograph, but it's not a photograph. Of course it's not a photograph. It, it, it doesn't equate with what, you know, Fox Talbot made as a photograph, whether it's a print or a negative or whatever. So I think it's a very strange world that we're in where, you know, if it looks like a duck and it, and it quacks like a duck, it must be a duck. Well, it, is it, you know? So I think it's really intriguing philosophically, and I don't think we've really come to terms with what it means. And I think there's some really interesting people writing about this and thinking about it. Something that kind of I engage with a lot is what, what does the medium do in this digital world? How do we work with it? Because a lot of what we're looking at is still analog. You know, we're still looking at photographs that were made by the photographers who worked in the analog period, but we're consuming them almost entirely digitally now. I mean, you know, apart we look at books and we go to the occasional exhibition and who, you know, who's, When's the last time somebody looked at a print, you know? Here's something you should do. I'm gonna leave it. This is my academic exercise for everybody who's in the room. Make an appointment at somewhere like the v &A photography reading rooms or uh, one of the big collections of photography and go and look at some 19th century photographs. Go and look at some album and prints from the 1860s. You will be blown away by the quality. You'll be absolutely mesmerized. Take a, take a magnifying glass with you because you'll need one because you'll be able to zoom in to the most incredible levels of detail and holding in your hand a print, an original print made by somebody. I did, I'm do, I've been doing a bit of research about Mecca, uh, working with Zia Gafic on a project he, we've been doing about the destruction of Mecca by the Saudi regime at the moment. And we discovered through our research that there was a, an Egyptian railway engineer who made photographs of Mecca back in 1860. And he was one of the very first Arab photographers to make work anywhere in the Middle East, actually. And we discovered there was a set of these panoramic prints in, in the V&A. So we went down and made an appointment and had a look. And they're absolutely amazing. I mean, stunning, stunning, stunning photographs. You know, and the quality is just phenomenal. So do yourself, do a treat. Go, go and look at some 19th century photographs. There's your homework for everybody who's listening in today. That sounds like great homework. I'm well up for that. Yeah. I love um, it. Well, archives are fantastic. I love archives. Yeah. <laughs> I've got a couple more questions for you. This one from Shira um, in the Zoom has asked, um, following on from your thoughts on your role as a photographer and photojournalist and your change of career, mm -hmm. what are your thoughts in the role of photojournalist today when news images often come from people's phones more often than not? Um, that's actually quite, because I don't think they do actually. I think that's a bit of a, that's a sort of popular misconception that they do. In fact, yes, I mean, obviously. They, they don't. But go on. Yes. Yeah. They don't. So, you know, people assume because, you know, the, occasionally a citizen journalist makes a photograph mm. that, that, that is seen mm. a lot. So the mm. July 7 bombings is often cited as that, the tube picture and so on. That's one image. And because it's, a, because it's the one image, everybody notices it. And it's kind of seen as, oh, wow, amazing. Citizen journalism, we don't need to press it over anymore. That then ignores the thousands and thousands and millions and millions and millions of pictures that do end up in the media that are sourced, that do come from professional image makers. Um, and, and also don't forget that, that although there are those incredible moments, and they're really important documents that, that come from citizen journalism, I don't want to deny that. It's very rare that they're stories. It's very rare that they're anything other than a single picture. Very often it's not contextualized. There's no narrative. 
there's no body of work there's no there's no ethics to it there's no thoughtfulness there's no research there's no position if you like and that's to me that's what we try to do with the course and that's what i think a lot of other educators are trying to do uh, it's what we're trying to do with the seven academy for example the work we're doing with with, with developing majority role photographers is giving people the intellectual and the aesthetic and the journalistic toolkit to create to tell stories and that's the big thing that differentiates for me there are very few there are very few citizen storytellers there are some obviously but most of those images that we see they are and also then what tends to happen as well i mean july 7 is quite a good example the bombings from from that if you look at the pictures that were published on the anniversary of the bombing almost everyone came from a professional photographer from ap or getty or whatever because those images are archived, they are accessible, they are collected, you can find them again. And that's the other big problem with lots of system journalism, it's very ephemeral, it appears and then it's, it's gone because it can't be found, it can't be archived, it can't be searched for and tagged and so on and so forth. So I think there is still a really important role for the professional journalist, professional photographer, even if that's not even working, if that, what, what's a professional these days? I mean, obviously that's a whole, God, we could do a whole, a whole seminar, a whole webinar on, <laughs> on how photographers work these days, but yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm just going to put my two hapens worth into that question, which was that. Um, yes, yeah, I'd love to hear your opinion as well. Yeah. yeah, well, the way that the way that it worked when I was working on the desk, on the news desk, is you'd, particularly when you're working on a web end of the story, so you've got to be really instant. Is you would get a lot of stuff coming in on Twitter, um, which is citizen journalism, but yeah. you don't go with the first, second, third, or fourth. You wait till there's a lot of imagery that is very similar. And then you might take something from it, but mm -hmm. as soon as you get a reputable journalist yeah. putting something through, which will happen very often within an hour, hour and a half, you take yeah. the citizen journalism away and you put professional journalism in. And the reason for doing that is um, because it's trusted, because yes. it's proper, it's real, and you can verify it because it's come from Reuters or AP or you know wherever, Getty. Um, Sometimes you would have stories. So I was um, I was on the desk as it happened during the Paris bombing of the Bataclan um, uh, nightclub, um, and it took us took me a long time before I was happy to because I was the picture editor on duty before I would put a picture up because I couldn't verify them and there were a lot of fakes coming in a lot. So you have to be really careful. And the news desks are really careful. They will um, wait until they've got something. So we would put a map up, Google map of where the Bataclan was. You'd find something else to illustrate it. So it's actually, if you're talking about newspapers, broadcasters, um, they are very, very careful about what they use and when they use it. So it, it's, uh, yeah, just to say it doesn't, it's a myth. <laughs> putting That's it out a really there, interesting yeah. insight thank you for that Bridget because I think so many of us would never know the other side of that and like the person who asked the question would assume that things have changed so much since citizen journalism it's really great to hear both sides of that from the journalist and the picture desk I've got one last question it's quite a long question so I'm going to post it into chat so you can read it along as I read it out I thought it might help um, so it's, uh, it's from Shabendu who says, um, hi Paul, this is fascinating for me to be finally listening to you. I was an MA in photojournalism student at Westminster a decade ago. In this decade and since even before that, we've been witnessing a sea of change in the larger photographic discourse, but even documentary and photography graduated into hybrid forms and conceptual approaches. Could you please speak about the shifts in these trends and why we are moving more towards exploring more conceptual crossover documentary approaches. Yeah, great question. Yeah, and it's something I spend quite a lot of time thinking about and indeed spending a lot of time talking with my students about because actually that's more or less where our course situates itself now is in that sort of space. Um, I think it's interesting. I mean, when I, when I was, you know, working mostly in, the, in that period of the late 80s, early 90s, it was still very much different camps, if you like. There was the journalistic camp of photojournalism, and there was the documentary, and there was the gallery world, and and people didn't really move so much between them um, because those worlds had their own sort of reference points, and they were 
to an extent, kind of self-sufficient. You know, if you were developing your career as a magazine editorial photographer, which is what I was doing, then you were working with Time and Newsweek and Stern and so on and so forth, and you could pretty much sustain a career doing that. And likewise, if you were trying to make it as a British documentary photographer, you know, you're working with Corner House, and you're working with Dowie Lewis, and you're working with, you know, and hopefully you would make it big, like, you know, Paul Graham, for example, and so on. Um, and, and then if you were doing fashion, you would be in, the, you know, you'd be in work in that, and so on and so forth. But I think over the course of sort of particularly the late 90s and 2000s, things began to shift because the economic crisis and the crisis in all those markets meant that photographers realized that, that working across different platforms, across different forms of media, across different ways of getting their work out and getting their work funded was much more uh, important. And I think, you know, I think we have to recognize, you know, someone like Martin Parr, obviously, as a, as a great sort of trailblazer in that space in that he was one of the photographers that did manage to transcend the boundaries between the gallery world, the book world, the, the magazine world, and worked seamlessly, and in, indeed the advertising world, and worked kind of seamlessly across all of them. And I think now photographers are realizing that what's important is getting your work to an audience. And they're trying to, and what I always say to people I work with is, who's your audience? Who are you trying to affect with this work? Who are you trying to get your message across to, even if you're not trying to you know, change the world, just who do you want to look at your work? Who are you trying to work with? And find the most effective platform or delivery system, if you like, for getting that work to the audience that you want to work with. And I think now, I mean, the irony now is that although you know, editorial work doesn't pay anymore, you still can get your work out there you know, on that mass market. And you can find other people that are interested in what you want to do. And so, although in one area the door closed and many other areas the door opened, and I think photography now is much more part of our larger culture and it's much more respected. There are loads more spaces now to see photography and to present photography and to engage, you know, look, and even just the photographic book market, you know, self referential and ghettoized as it might arguably be, is still amazing. It's incredible books being produced. Um, and and there were, there's a fraction of what, even when I started, uh, were, were being produced. So I think there are incredible opportunities now um, and photography as a medium has grown up in a way and it's, it's now, it's much easier now to be much more fluid and move between different uh, spaces, if you like, and find, find a way of building an alliance with different people that want to work on the things that you want to work on and you can get the work out across a range of different media. It's kind of multimedia, if you like, or multi-platform, you know, storytelling, if you like. And I think that's been the big shift, really. And I think the photographers that have been able to embrace that and understand that and make the most of it are the ones who are being successful at the moment and creating a, a really unique space for themselves as, I don't know, what, what we call ourselves, artists, photographers, documentarians. You know, In a way, we like labels. We like kind of giving things labels. But in many ways, those labels are pretty superfluous. Uh, what matters is, is making interesting and challenging work that people are going to engage with and think about and... Um, I mean, I think, you know, we, don't, we shouldn't expect photography to change the world. I think uh, Diddy Huberman has this great line in his book um, about the pictures from Auschwitz, where he says that we simultaneously, so kind of taking on all the critics of photography, like, so simultaneously we expect too much and too little of photography. We shouldn't expect it to change the world, but equally shouldn't expect it to do nothing. Mm. And it's part of a larger um, endeavor, if you like, to, to help people understand and make sense of what's going on around them. And it plays a really important role in that, but it doesn't do it on its own. It, 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 and no one body of photographs or no one photographer operates in isolation. We all work together. Um, we all work in a kind of conversation with the medium and with a conversation with the world, if you like. And it's about, for me, it's about start. It's about, it's about making people think and making people engage and making people, it's, it's helping people on a journey, really. You know, use your work to, to start conversations, to bring people in, to, uh, to tell them things. The cat's appeared, brilliant. I was going to bring my yeah, dog in, but he's got a bit too crazy. Time, I'm got, sorry. Got two yeah, cats. Uh, oh, two cats. It's double stereo cats. Fantastic. <laughs> we did warn of a pet accident might happen. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, yeah. I, I left my dog upstairs, otherwise he would He's a black dog, so he doesn't he doesn't film very well. But uh, he he would say hello otherwise. It's yeah. Black Pets United at the moment it's for it's all it's Pets. Paul, right, um, yeah. oh, just adding to your answer there. I mean, they've asked about um, conceptual approaches in photojournalism now, but thinking back to some like the picture post photographs, talking about looking at old images, quite often they were 
there was quite a lot of conceptual and stylized work. Uh, I'm not sure if yeah. they as much as photojournalism, but in the news, they these these images were used regularly in the news um, a long time ago, and yeah, it's okay. quite yeah, yeah. images. Yeah, if you want, if you, again, if you want to, if you want another homework assignment, go back and look at magazines from the 1930s. Look at Berliner Illustrated Zeitung and, and Süddeutsche Zeitung, and, and as you said, Picture Post and uh, Stefan Laurent's work. Um, God's whole rabbit holes we could go down about that. But yes, I mean, absolutely. There's, and again, go back to the 19th century. You know, some of the work being produced then is really interesting. You know, visually. Uh, so yes, I mean, I think most. I mean, one of the one of the I did a. I've recently done a couple of kind of histories of photography books. I did a, a book called Chronology of Photography, Thames and Hudson, and A Thousand and One Photographs to See Before You Die, which I was the kind of series editor for. Sounds good. And they were both really interesting for me because it made me look at a lot of work that I'd never really engaged in before, particularly 19th century work. And just the scale of output and the, the incredible amount of material that was being produced then and the intelligence and the creativity, and as you said, the conceptual thinking that was going on. You know, back, I mean, Timothy O'Sullivan's pictures of the American West are absolutely phenomenal, you know, incredible images, you know, you couldn't beat them today. Uh, and they're obviously very seminal in the history of photography and have influenced, you know, whole generations of photographers. But, you know, go back to the source, I think, and you'll be really surprised at how, how little we've learned in a funny way. Um, there's some great writing by, oh God, I've forgotten his name now. There's a really good American writer who was writing in the 1860s and his writing about what photography is as this new medium that's just appeared is absolutely phenomenal. You know, it, it, all the questions that we're struggling with today about, you know, the nature of photography uh, he was engaging with back in the 1860s. So we haven't come that far, actually. I mean, it's a very new medium, if you think about it, in history of culture, and history of art. We're still in our infancy uh, and we've got, and yet, and it's always a medium that's been dictated by technology, you know. Um, don't forget that you have this incredible, uh, probably we should finish on this, although we've gone for hours, but you have this incredible moment in the middle of the 19th century when three different people come up with three different solutions pretty much at the same time. Um, so Herschel, Foxhalber, and, and Niepce and Dag Daguerre. Three very different, radically different ways to create a fixed still image simultaneously. And like overnight, the medium appears. You know, in, mm -hmm. in, in, in the 18, late 1840s, just a few years after um, the invention of the medium, there were 10,000 daguerreotype photographers in America, professional studio photographers, 10,000, like overnight, boom. You know, they were making, I think they made 2 million daguerreotype plates a year. So that was the Instagram of the 1850s, mm. you know, and that just disappeared overnight. There was a whole town called Daguerreville to make daguerreotypes in, in the Hudson Valley, just north of New York. The entire city was built, or the entire town was built about around the daguerreotype, and the daguerreotype then just disappeared. Poof, it's gone. Because they moved on to a new technology of negatives and prints. And so on. Yeah, gone for this for hours, I'm afraid. We could, we and there's loads of questions that I didn't <laughs> ask, which we probably need to do another one, Debbie. Um, I think we do. I think we need yeah. to come back and talk more because we could yeah. talk about photography for so long. Yeah. <laughs> Paul, thank you so much, and thank everybody thank for watching and listening and sending in your brilliant questions. Um, I just got one small shout out for Ben Smith, whose podcast channel Absolutely. called A Small Voice. It's a brilliant resource for interviews with amazing collection of photographers. And I came across it when I was researching into Paul. Um, it's well worth dipping into. And um, if you want to listen to Paul again, you can find him on there. So yeah. th thank you so much. And also yeah, big shout out to Ben, definitely, absolutely. Sorry, to, big shout out to Ben, definitely. Fantastic yeah. guy. Oh, someone just asked, what, this, what is the podcast, please? Um, so how about we tweet a link? <laughs> it's called small, small Voice. Voice. Small Voice, and we will um, we'll share a link on our Facebook up under this video. Um, I'd like to mention that our next talk will be the same time next week, and I will be interviewing Sean Burnell. Um, I hope you can all join us. And we've also talked a bit about the COVID project, which is mass isolation format. Here's the link on um, Instagram. Share with us your photographs, share your stories. We really want to see what you're doing. We want to, we're working with um, Paul and LCC to build up this long, this collection of what is happening in the world, what we're all experiencing. And this is building towards an exhibition at format in March. 21 which will happen digitally or physically dependent on what the situation is but hopefully we'll all see you there in in derby and we'll hopefully see you all here again next week
join us right. either via Rembrandt or on Facebook. Oh, right. brilliant comments. People are saying how much they've enjoyed it, Paul. Paul it's right. Absolutely. Thanks engaged. very much. So, so here, here's the other invitation. If we do manage to, if we do format in the real world, you can come and listen to me DJ. And if we do it virtual, we'll find some way of doing a virtual Northern Soul session as well. How's that? Definitely. Oh, fantastic. We can dance in our kitchens. Kitchen exactly. disco. Yeah, you want to help with that? Whole, got people... a point of which, uh, my closing comment is <laughs> Google Northern Soul kitchen dancing and it will make oh, okay. you smile. There's a whole million. Oh, okay. <laughs> Louise, <laughs> our, um, the director of format, has just said yes. So um, it is now <laughs> being, we've got witnesses. You are DJing virtually or physically, whatever come rain mm -hmm. or shine, you are going to be DJing for us at format again. Great. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you very much. Thanks, Nathan. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you, Debbie, Bye. for hosting this so efficiently and so wonderfully. And thank you to the audience. It was a huge pleasure. Great questions. I really enjoyed it. Thank you so yeah. much for spending time with us. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you to you both. It's been absolutely brilliant. Thoroughly engaging. And thank you all for attending. See you next week. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.